Let's have a word of prayer. Pray with me. Holy Spirit, fall upon us, fill us, inspire us, teach us, and lead us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Jesus always was. Christ always was. Before Jesus was born, Christ was. Christ was before the foundation of the earth. As a matter of fact, he's the one that created the universe. John 1 says, all things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. Christ always was. But 2,000 years ago, the Christ who created the universe decided to take on human form. I didn't understand that for a long time, but when I was 11 years old, my Sunday school teacher made it very clear. She said, imagine if you can a man who loved dance, and out behind his house he had an anthill. And every day he would go out and yell at the ants, I love you, I love you, I love you, but the ants never got the message. So he brought them bread and sugar and jam, and, but they still didn't get the message in spite of all the good gifts. And then the teacher said, I didn't tell you one thing about this man. He had magical powers, and he could transform himself into anything. If he wanted to really tell the ants how much he loved them, what would he have to do? With one voice, all the guys in this little Sunday school class said, he would become an ant. Exactly, she said. Only by becoming one of them could he communicate with them. And we got the message. 2,000 years ago, the Christ that created the universe became one of us because it was the only way he could communicate his love for us. And he did it in the ultimate way. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for those that he loves. And Christ did that. He laid down his life. He ascended into heaven, but before he left, he told his disciples, I'm coming back and I will be in you. People, there's a big difference between Christ being with us and Christ being in us. And I want to ask a very simple question. Not do you believe that Christ is with you. I want to know whether you believe that Christ is in you. Have you invited Christ to become a living presence within you and transform you uh, from within? Christ had a body 2,000 years ago. They called him Jesus. He has a body today. It's called the church. Christ wants to be in each one of you. He wants to be in each one of you just like he was in Jesus of Nazareth 2,000 years ago. You say, wait a minute. There's a big difference between Christ being in Jesus and Christ being in me or any of us. You're not saying it's the same thing. I'm saying what it says in the eighth chapter of Romans. It says this, and the same spirit that was in Christ Jesus shall be in your mortal bodies. It couldn't be any clearer than that. It's the same Christ that was in Jesus that wants to be in you and wants to be in me. And the question today as we talk about all these great issues, is Christ in us or are we just doing it out of, out of emotion? Are we just doing it out of, out of obligation? Or is Christ within us motivating us, empowering us, directing us to do the things that we are supposed to be doing. If Christ is in you, you'll do what Jesus would do. You know, we, we started this movement. We started this movement called Red Letter Christians. And the point of the movement was that we need for Christians, we need for Christians to be empowered by the living Christ. They, I mean, Reverend Barber talking about the spirit falling upon us and being in us and working through us. And this is crucial to the whole ball game. But if Christ is in you, in your everyday life, you'll do what Jesus would do if Jesus was in your place. I, uh, I remember when I got drafted into the army. That was a long time ago. Uh, it was during the Korean War. That's how old I am. I'm really old. You know you're old when your wife says, let's go upstairs and have sex, and you say, I can't do both. You know, you know you're old. So, uh, uh, you know, it was a long time ago that I got drafted, and I went down to the draft offices, and they didn't want me. They interviewed me, and the lieutenant that was interviewing me uh, said, what's your problem? I said, I just read this book 
by Charles Sheldon, entitled In His Steps. And what he did was he called us, each one of us, to do what Jesus would do in Jesus, if Jesus was in our place. You can make me into a soldier, but I don't know that I could run a bayonet into somebody and cut out his guts. I don't think that's what Jesus would do. He said, you're making it sound very ugly. I said, it is ugly. He said, what if you were in an airplane and we're about to drop a bomb? Could you do that? I said, my hand's on the lever and I'm about to drop the bomb. And I asked a very simple question. Jesus, if you were in my place, would you drop this bomb? The lieutenant yelled at me and said, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Everybody knows that Jesus would never drop a bomb. That's an important statement. That's an important statement. Would Jesus drop a bomb? What would Jesus say about warfare? If we take the Sermon on the Mount seriously, we would end up loving our enemies. Shane Claiborne often says, when Jesus said, love your enemies, he probably meant we shouldn't kill them. That seems to be an obvious statement, but Americans don't look at it that way. They think they can be imitators of Jesus and not do what Jesus would do if Jesus was in their place. I remember when I was in high school, I was in homeroom 48, which is where all the jocks were assigned. I was on the basketball team, so they put me in homeroom 48. I love being in homeroom 48, because everybody at West Philadelphia High School knew who was in homeroom 48. I'd come to school, I'd walk down the hall, the girls would line the walls and sing How Great Thou Art. <laughs> and, and I loved it. I walked into my homeroom and, and there they were, all the jocks, the football team, the basketball team, and then there were four guys. I don't know whether they should have been there. They were the members of the chess team. <laughs> Nothing wrong with being chess players. They're great people, but the truth is that these four guys were kind of strange. And one of them in particular was a real wimp. And I asked myself a very simple question. Jesus, if you were in my place, who would you befriend? Would you go to the back of the room and sit, sit with the super jocks? Or would you become a friend of the kid who has no friends? It didn't take me a moment to know the answer to that one. So I went over and sat down next to this wimp. It turned out to be the smartest move I ever made. The kid was brilliant in algebra. He carried me my whole senior year. I don't know what would have happened had I not linked up with this kid. And more important, when I got to know him, he was the most interesting, humorous person I had known in the whole high school. He was a sharp, witty, wonderful. Isn't it amazing the way we let Societal stereotypes determine who our friends are. Do we allow society to determine who we choose to be friends with? I was friends with this guy because I knew that that's what Jesus would do. Now, I wish this story had a wonderful ending like a Southern Baptist preacher would give to it. You know, and because I love that wimp, because I cared for that wimp, because I reached out to that wimp, today, that wimp, is Barack Obama. <laughs> this kid stayed a wimp, but he's the most glorious, wonderful wimp you could ever meet. He walks the walk. To be a Christian is to allow Christ to be in you and motivate you to do what Jesus would do if Jesus was in your place. It makes you into a radical person. During World War II, not a single Bulgarian Jew ever died in a concentration camp. That's amazing. Bulgaria was a Nazi nation. Hitler didn't have to send his army in to conquer Bulgaria. It was allied with Hitler from the very beginning of the war. And yet in spite of that, not a single Bulgarian Jew ever died in a concentration camp. Most of that is due to what one man did, Metropolitan Kirill. He's a name that's gotten lost in history and it shouldn't have been because he's one of those guys that did what Jesus would do. When they rounded up the Jews in Sophia and put them in a barbed wire enclosure down at the train station, waiting for the train to drive up and, and take them 
uh, to who knows where like Auschwitz. They were there. It was a rainy, misty night. Out of the fog came Metropolitan Kirill, the leader of the Bulgarian church. He stood six foot four to start with. But in addition to six foot four, being an Orthodox priest, he wore a mitre on top of his head. That gives them an extra foot. So if you can see this seven foot four figure emerging from the fog, he, he had a huge white beard that hung down to his waist. He strode forward so quickly and his gait was so great that the men who were following him had to run to keep up with him. He came to the entrance of the barbed wire enclosure. They raised the guns. They said, you can't go in there, father. He pushed the guns aside. He marched in among the Jews and the Jews gathered around him, waiting to see what the church had to say in their hour of desperation and need. He raised his arms. He quoted one verse of scripture and changed the destiny of a nation. You say, what verse could do that? Here's the verse. He raised his arms and shouted at the top of his lungs to these Jewish people, a verse from the book of Ruth. He yelled, whithersoever thou goest, I will go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. <laughs> and the Jews cheered. The Jews cheered loudly. And the men who had come and followed him to the barbed wire enclosure, they screamed and yelled cheers as well. The uproar was so great that frightened people came out of their houses, rushed down to the train station, and the crowd grew larger and larger and larger. And, and the SS troopers knew they couldn't get away with it. And so they boarded the train themselves and left, and they never came back again because a man moved by the Spirit of God was ready to say, I am willing to stand with the oppressed. If Christ is in you, you will always stand with the oppressed, always stand with those at the margins, always stand with those who are rejected by society. When I come here, I get a breath of fresh air because I see all these signs that indicate that they're gay friendly. I gotta tell you, every Christian should be gay friendly. Let's face it, let's face it. The church has done horrors to these brothers and sisters. I mean, they commit suicide at an incredible rate because they feel the anger of church people. I don't know what else Jesus is about, but he's about this. He's about loving those who society may reject, affirming those who society may put down, loving those who are on the margins. When I was in high school, there, there was this kid named Roger. He was gay, and they made fun of him. Tough inner city school. West Philadelphia High was tough on kids like that. And they made fun of him. They ridiculed him at every turn. On Fridays when there was phys ed, he was always afraid to go into the showers because he was afraid of what would happen to him from the kids who weren't gay. When he came out, we were always waiting with our wet towels and we would whip them and sting his little naked body. I wasn't there the day they dragged little Roger into the shower, shoved him into the corner. And while he screamed and cried and begged for help, five guys urinated all over him. He went home and that night he went to bed at about 10 o'clock his parents said it was probably about two o'clock in the morning when he got up and went down to the basement of his house and he hung himself. And I knew I wasn't a Christian. If I was a Christian, if Christ was in me, I would have done what Jesus would have done. I would have been a friend of his. I would have stood up for him. I wouldn't have let the other kids pick on him. I would have put my arm around him and say, you're my friend. Don't let them get you. But I was afraid to do that because I was a high school senior and I wanted to be popular. Oh, what we're willing to trade for popularity and for social acceptance. I wish I could go back and be Roger's friend. I wish I could do what the Holy Spirit would have motivated me to do if I had allowed the Holy Spirit to be in me. Christ wants to be in you. The same Christ that was in Jesus and raised him from the dead, says the eighth chapter of Romans, 
That same Christ wants to be in you. And the question today, is he? Now, I know you're believers. Who else comes to a thing like this? <laughs> believers, believers, believers. It's easy to be a believer. But Jesus primarily calls us to be disciples. And there is a big difference, people, between a believer and a disciple. A believer. A believer is somebody who says yes to certain propositional truths. A disciple is somebody who lives out the life of his master or her master, lives out the life of Jesus. Are you a disciple today? I, I'm, I'm sure you're a believer, but are you a disciple? Has Christ invaded you? Is he in you? Is he motivated you to do the things that Jesus would do if Jesus was in your place. There's a, a guy that I heard about many years ago. He's dead now. Comes out of Koinonia Farms, Clarence Jordan. He went to preach in the hills of North Carolina. Here we are in the hills of North Carolina. It was 1955. He came out on the platform to speak at this revival meeting in this Baptist church. And to his amazement, the congregation was racially integrated, black and white people sitting next to each other. When the service was over, he asked the old hillbilly preacher, how'd you get this way? Old hillbilly preacher said, what way? He said, integrated, white people, black people, worshiping together, being in the same place. How did you get this way? Has this come about since the decision? This old hillbilly preacher said, what decision? He said, the Supreme Court decision, Brown versus the Board of Education, you know, that, oh, he says, the Supreme Court, what's that got to do with Christians? Fair question. <laughs> do we need the Supreme Court to tell us who we should love, who we should embrace, who we should treat with justice? He said, now, preacher, you know you got an unusual situation. He said, well, this church had a handful of members and the pastor died and they couldn't get a new preacher know-how, so finally I volunteered. And I said, I'll be a preacher. They didn't have anybody else, so they let me preach. And the next Sunday I got up and I preached. And I preached from that verse where it says, in Christ there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, Scythian nor barbarian, male nor female. Everybody becomes one in Christ Jesus. And I preached how Jesus makes people one, regardless of the differences that they may have racially and sexually. And I talked about the oneness in Christ. And when the service was over, the, the deacons called me in the back room. And they told me they didn't want to hear that kind of preaching no more. <laughs> Clarence said, well, what did you do? He said, I fired them deacons. <laughs> well, if a deacon's not going to deke, <laughs> you might as well fire them. He said, how come they didn't fire you? He said, they never hired me. <laughs> There's a case for the unpaid clergy, amen? Uh -huh, right. I mean, if they don't pay you, they can't fire you. He said, once I found out what bothered those people, I gave them the same message every Sunday, how in Christ, no racial differences bar relationships of love and fellowship. He said, I gave it to them every week. The old Clarence said, did they put up with it? He said, I preached that church down to four. People, sometimes revival begins not when you get a lot of new people in the church, but when you get a lot of the old people out of the church. You know what I mean? <laughs> Jesus goes to his hometown, Nazareth, and it says he could do no mighty works there because of their unbelief. I wonder how many pastors here have to put up with congregations which are filled with people who, who aren't really surrendered to Christ and make hell for them and make hell for people who are on the borders who are on the lines, who are, who are just rejected by society at large. You gotta be tough if you're gonna be a preacher. You gotta be able to put up with those who come against you because they will come against you. The uh, reality is that if Christ is in you, you will do what Jesus would do if Jesus was in your place. It's as simple and as direct as that. The second thing is, you'll be able to find Jesus in other people. If Christ is in you, he will open your eyes to the fact that Jesus is waiting to be loved in people around you. 
That is so crucial. I mean, if sometimes those of us on the liberal end of the spectrum are kind and generous and work for justice on behalf of people who have been kicked in around in society, black people, Asian people, Hispanic people, gay people, transgendered people. We, 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 we speak boldly for them. But sometimes we come across as people who pity them, who pity them. And let me just say forthrightly, pity diminishes the dignity of the other person. We have too much pity and not enough compassion. There's the difference. Pity diminishes the dignity of the other, diminishes the dignity and the worth of the other. When you look into the eyes of somebody who's a transsexual, what do you see? Mother Teresa said, every time I looked into the eyes of a man dying of AIDS, I had this eerie awareness that Jesus was staring back at me. I'm walking down Chestnut Street in Philadelphia. This homeless man is walking towards me. The kind of man that you'll find on almost any street in every city. Yelling and screaming at somebody who wasn't even there. You know what I'm talking about. Yelling and screaming and nobody's there. He's yelling and screaming and he's holding in his hand a cup of McDonald's coffee. He spots me and he says, hey, mister, you want some of my coffee? This filthy, dirty street man, greasy beard, had a cup of McDonald's, the styrofoam cup with smudge from the filth off of his beard. You want some of my coffee? To tell the truth, I didn't want any of his coffee. <laughs> but I knew the right thing to do was to affirm his generosity. So I took the cup and I took a sip and I gave it back to him and I said, you're getting generous, aren't you? Giving away your coffee to people you don't even know? What's gotten into you today, fella? You don't know me? Come on, why are you giving away your coffee so easily? And he said, well, the coffee today was especially delicious. And I figure if God gives you something good, you should share it with people. I thought, oh, I thought, oh no. This sucker has set me up. It's gonna cost me $10, I know it. I said, you want something from me, don't you? He said, yeah, I want a hug. I was hoping for the $10. <laughs> And I gave him back the cup, and he went on his way. But as I was hugging him, as he was in my arms and as I was hugging him, I was embarrassed. People were passing me and looking at me, at hugging this dirty, cruddy street man, and I'm embarrassed. But little by little, the embarrassment turned to awe and reverence because I could hear that voice echoing down the corridors of time saying, I was hungry, did you feed me? I was naked, did you clothe me? I was sick, did you care for me? I was in prison, did you visit me? I was the alien, the stranger from another land, did you take me in? And I knew that I had been holding Jesus in my arms. Jesus in my arms, it changes everything. When you recognize the other person as Jesus, if Christ within you opens your eyes to the sacredness of the other, you will not be asking, am I noble enough to serve? You will be asking this question, am I worthy? Am I worthy? The minute you begin to sense Jesus in the other person, it changes the way in which you relate to that person. To relate to those who suffer as though each was Jesus. That's what happens when Christ is in you. He opens your eyes to see people in a totally new way. We see no one, says the scripture, after the flesh. We see everyone in the spirit. That's what the Bible says. It's a new way of looking at people. To relate to people who are in need. That's what the church was called to do. 2,000 years ago, Jesus was the physical body of Jesus. Today, the church is supposed to be the body of Jesus. In the 12th chapter of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, the 27th verse, 
It says this, ye are the body of Christ. You are the body of Christ. Jesus was the body of Christ 2,000 years ago. We are the body of Christ here and now. And I know what you're gonna say. Well, you don't live like Jesus and I don't live like Jesus. No, and it's about time we make a commitment to try, amen? I mean, let's be honest. We don't live like Jesus. Whenever I sign a book, I always sign it Philippians 3, 13, and 14. Not as though I have already arrived. No, not as though I have already achieved. But forgetting those things which are behind, I'm pressing towards the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm on my way, people. I'm not there. People ask me, are you a Christian? I say, I'm on my way to becoming a Christian. Sergeant Kierkegaard said, if you mean by Christian, somebody who lives like Jesus, who then is Christian in any generation, there might be four or five. I'm not there yet. I'm saved because salvation is what Jesus Christ did for me on Calvary's cross. I'm saved. But there's a difference between being saved and being filled with the Spirit of Christ. There's a difference between having eternal blessings in heaven and being alive because Christ is in you here and now. There's not much aliveness in this world. You'll admit that, won't you? People are dead. Man, they're dead. I was on an elevator in Chicago. We came down to the ground floor. There's a kid next to me. He's got his baseball hat on sideways. His pants are hanging low. You've seen this, haven't you? Really low. In this case, you could not only see his underwear, you could see the crack. I had a strong temptation to take out my pencil. I said, how you doing? He said, okay. He said, having a good day? Yeah. How's life going for you these days? All right. Deader, deader you cannot imagine. We got down to the ground floor, the elevator did not open. I started banging on the door. I'm yelling, open this door. Somebody out there, get this door open. All of a sudden I heard a voice behind me say, sir, the door is open. I turned, it was one of those elevators that had doors on both sides, and I'm banging on the wrong door. And this kid did not laugh. He started off the elevator, I grabbed him and pulled him back. I said, kid, laugh, this is funny. <laughs> you say, what's this got to do with having Christ in you? When Christ is in you, the fruits of the spirit are obvious and number one is love, number two is joy. There is a joy and an exuberance and an aliveness about. I remember the first time I met somebody who was into the Pentecostal movement. Man, there was a young woman in my high school named Dorothy. Overnight, she seemed to come alive, vibrantly alive. Whoa, I wanted what she had. So I went to the Pentecostal church where she attended one Sunday night, and they called people forward, and they lined us up, and the guy went down and pounded people on the head. You've seen this on television, have you? Everybody he hit fell over, except me. He hit me on the head and nothing happened. He moved on and knocked over some other people. Then he came back and he hit me again. <laughs> Nothing. I went home and I was despondent. I was really sad because I wanted that experience. Listen, I not only wanted to believe in Jesus, I wanted to feel the living Christ within me. I wanted to feel his presence. I wanted what John Wesley experienced when in Aldersgate, he, he felt the spirit of God strangely warm his heart and come alive with the assurance of his salvation. I wanted what Blaise Pascal experienced as he sat alone in a dark room and 10.30 at night, as he writes in his diary, I felt the spirit fire, 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 not the God of the philosophers, not the God of the theologians, not the God of the ethicists, not the God of the astronomers and the mathematicians and the scientists, but the God that was alive in Abraham, Moses and Jacob. Fire, fire, fire. Joy, 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 fire, joy, fire, joy, unspeakable joy. Isn't that what I want? That's what you want? Don't you want more than just a theology? Don't you want something more than just a set of theological propositions that you can affirm? Don't you want to be surrendered so that the Christ can invade you, be in you, and move through you to be an instrument of change in the world? If this conference is about anything, it's about changing the world. 
when I listen to Reverend Barber, I always kind of shake a little bit because he calls us to action. He calls us to do something. But this is what the Bible says. This is what Jesus says. Without me, you can do nothing. A few years ago, a group of us gathered in Washington, D.C. with Jim Wallace. He's usually a speaker here. I think I'm kind of replacing him this year, which is a sad thing. But uh, I, I was with uh, Jim Wallace down, down in Washington, and, and we were talking about Christ being in us and Christ being with us and working through us and that without him, we can do nothing. You know, I'm an old guy. I'm really old. I'm pushing 85, so you can see that that's old. Having said that, I remember the 50s and the 60s. And there were all of these wonderful people calling for an end of world war against Vietnam, calling an end to racism, sexism, militarism, homophobia. They had all the right issues. And we marched, and we were growing in number. And then it all died out. It all died out. Jerry Rubin ended up selling stocks and bonds on Wall Street. I mean, the leaders of the counterculture movement lost their energy. We all lose our energy. But those, listen to this from the Bible, they who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up like eagles and fly. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Please note the development. First, you end up flying like eagles. You'll come home from this conference and you'll say, I'm flying like an eagle. Within two weeks, you'll still be running with this thing. And then a little later, you'll be walking and you hope you don't faint. You lose it. You lose it. You lose it unless the Holy Spirit invades you and unless the Holy Spirit is renewed within you. I didn't get the Holy Spirit at that Pentecostal meeting. But it was a Roman Catholic friend that introduced me to the writings of St. Ignatius. And I learned new ways of praying. I mean, I'm Baptist, so I, I pray Baptist. You know how Baptists pray. We read off a list of non-negotiable demands to the Almighty. And we tell God a lot of stuff that God already knows. I mean, when you say, dear Lord, Sister Mary is sick in the hospital, what do you think God's saying? Whoa, I didn't know that. Which hospital? <laughs> Let me break it to you. God knows what you need before you even ask. I still make my prayers known to God, my requests known to God, but it's not to inform God, it's in order to establish dependency upon God for every good and perfect gift. I lean on the Lord. I lean on the Lord in my prayers. But too often our prayers are nothing but a list of requests. Often we're simply sophisticated forms of my son at the, age of, at the age of eight years old coming into the living room and saying, I'm going to bed. I'm going to be praying. Anybody want anything? <laughs> and you begin to realize this kid's view of prayer needs some improvement. But don't we all need improvement? If our prayers are nothing more than requests, you say, what did you learn from your Ignatian friend? I learn to pray in quietude and in stillness. I wake up in the morning before I have to, and I lie in bed in stillness, and I don't ask God for anything. I simply surrender. Sometimes I say the name Jesus over and over and over again. You say, why do you do that? I don't know. It drives back the dark forces. You say, are you believing in dark forces, evil forces? Yes. Did Jesus believe in dark forces? Did he believe in demons? You bet he did. So who do you think you are that you know more about spiritual reality than Jesus? It drives back the dark spirits. It creates what the ancient Celtic Christians called a thin place. A thin place. A setting in which the walls between you and God become so thin that you can feel the spirit coming through and enveloping you. I wish I could say this happens every morning, but it doesn't. It happens often enough. 
And when it does, I feel the Spirit invade me. I feel the Spirit flow into me. I don't ask God for anything except His Spirit. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. Invade me. Be within me. I want Christ within me. I don't want a theological statement as important as that is. I want a presence. I want to be alive in Christ. Is Christ in you? If Christ is in you, it will attack a lot of things. You will attack a lot of things. One of the things that has to be attacked right now is what we call ethno-nationalism. This idea that God is an American. I, I heard John Howard Yoder one time in a debate with another minister, and finally uh, the guy said to John Howard Yoder, the important thing is that we both worship the same God. He said, I don't think we do. Are we worshiping the same God? If you have a God that is racist, homophobic, if you have a God that declares war on people, that doesn't oppose capital punishment, then you and I don't have the same God. When Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy, that's what it's all about. One of my former students, Brian Stevenson, has become world famous overnight be because of his opposition to the death penalty. And I asked Brian, are you opposed to the death penalty? I suppose you are. He said, how can you believe in the death penalty? When Jesus said, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. He did say that, you know. Red letter Christians are people who say, we're going to do what Jesus would do. If he shows mercy, we will show mercy. He said, and even if you did believe in capital punishment, you wouldn't believe in capital punishment here in the United States, where there are two kinds of justice. One kind of justice for rich people and another kind of justice for poor people. And if you don't know that, you don't know much about America. The truth is, the people go to the electric chair. Not because they're guilty. Maybe they're guilty, maybe they're not. They go to the electric chair for one reason. When they have their day in court, they don't have anybody really good to speak for them, to defend them. And then he smiled at me and he said, except in Montgomery, Alabama. Because in Montgomery, Alabama, Doc, I speak for the poor. I defend the poor. I'm the voice of the poor. And Doc, he said, I'm good. I'm really good. You bet he's good. To date, he's gotten 183 people off of death row by proving they were innocent because they didn't have a good day in court. That's doing what Jesus would do. It's being a voice for those who have no voice. It's speaking for those who cannot speak for themselves. This is part of what it means to have Christ in you. Having Christ is in, in you is not simply getting a ticket to get into heaven when you die. Man, I remember when I was a kid, that's all I ever heard. The preacher looking down at me, I'm 12 years old, he's yelling, are you ready to die? I'm 12 years old. I'm glad at the age of 85 that there is a heaven and that there is a life with Christ after this life is over. But people, he came not to get you into heaven when you die. That's a secondary thing. His primary thing was to create a people through whom, listen to this, he could create the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. That's why he came. Are you ready to surrender and allow Christ to invade you, to be in you, and transform you into somebody who will work for the transformation of the world into the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God is wherever God's will is done on earth as it is in heaven. These are the important things that we need to recognize. Emil Durkheim, perhaps the most famous of modern sociologists, wrote a book called The Elementary Forms of the Religious Life. He wanted to answer the question of where these various ideas of God come from. Because as he traveled from one society to another, he found that belief in God was universal. But the way God is defined differs from one society to another. You know that. The way people in Africa think about God is different than the way in which people in Latin America think about God, which is different than the way in which people in North America think about God. Every society has its own conception of God. Why is this? He studied a group of Aboriginal people in the interior of Australia. They were just inventing their God concepts. 
Step number one, he discerned. They developed certain traits and values that ensured their survival as a tribe. Strength would be a good value, and so they ended up with a totem, an animal, to symbolize the traits of the tribe. Strong as an ox, wisdom, wise, smarts, that'll help you survive. Wise as an owl, sly as a fox, swift as a deer. These are traits that ensure survival of a people. That's the first stage. You come up with the values that the tribe thinks are essential to its members. Tribe number two, here it is. They come up with an animal to symbolize the traits of the tribe. Strong as an ox, wise as an owl, sly as a fox, fast as a deer. An animal to symbolize the traits of a tribe is called a totem, from which we get the word totem pole, where you end up with totems. Stage number three, little by little, you end up worshiping, worshiping the totem, worshiping the deity that is nothing more than an embodiment of your own traits and values. So it was, said Durkheim, that people end up worshiping a God that is nothing more than a symbolic representation of their own traits and values. Religion is a process where people end up worshiping a God that is an embodiment of their own values. That's what's happened in the United States of America. All over this country, we have churches that are not preaching the Bible, not preaching the Jesus that is revealed in those red letters of the Bible, but preaching another Jesus. And Paul warns us in 2 Corinthians, the second chapter, beware of those who come and present another Jesus unto you. The Jesus that I hear being proclaimed from churches from one end of this country to the other comes across as a white Anglo-Saxon Republican. Nothing wrong with being a Republican. You say, well, you seem to have a, an edge against them. Well, it's not that they're Republicans. I'm against any group that supports putting children at the border in cages. I oppose any party that in fact gerrymanders the voting districts so that black people are denied their political power. I'm against any society that in fact uh, is against preserving the environment. If the party doesn't stand for environmentalism, doesn't stand for the dignity of children, tries to suppress the vote, tries to gerrymander, and doesn't take care of the environment. Yes, I'm against that party. And if they're Democrats, and don't kid yourself, don't think there aren't Democrats to say exactly the same thing. We must be beyond partisan politics. We must look for politicians that embody the values of Jesus found in the red letters of the Bible. Amen. Yeah. We've got to become radical in that sense. We've got to become radical in that sense. Does America worship Jesus? Or does America worship a deity that is nothing more than an incarnation of American values? And if you oppose American values, they think, they think you're opposing Jesus. George Bernard Shaw said it this way, God created us in his image and we decided to return the favor. <laughs> <laughs> when I was a boy, I was in this African-American church and they had a Sunday school class that I taught, and there was a picture of Jesus. Solomon said of Christ, and one Sunday, it was gone. And there was another picture of Jesus on the wall, and he was black. I said, who put that there? And this one kid who had an afro. You remember the afros? It took up the whole room. He was wearing shades. He was very intimidating. He said, I did, baby. And he didn't look like one of those Martin Luther King nonviolent types. I said, Jesus wasn't a black man. He said he wasn't a white hunky either, was he? He didn't like me making Jesus into what I am. I didn't like him making Jesus into what he is. There's a Chinese Catholic church in downtown Philadelphia. There's a stained glass window with the image of Jesus in the stained glass. Guess what Jesus is in the stained glass window? You got it. He's Chinese. A Chinese Jew, it kind of blows your mind when you think about it. Isn't this the tendency to recreate God in our own image 
And then, in fact, he affirms who we are and what we are. He affirms our prejudices, our hatreds, our values. And if Christ is in you, that gets shattered. When he goes to his hometown, Nazareth, to preach, as he does in the fourth chapter of Luke, he's going along fine. Read that chapter. They're cheering him because he has announced that he is the Messiah, the fulfillment of the things that were written by the prophet Isaiah. They're all thrilled. He's got the crowd with him. They're marveling, and he loses the whole crowd with one statement. He said, but more spiritual than you is a Lebanese woman who cared for the prophets, is a Syrian man who understood the healing of the Holy Spirit. The crowd rises up. They didn't want their God to belong to anybody else but themselves. I have the sense sometimes that there are Americans who want God to be an American, to belong to us. But God does not come that way, and Jesus does not come that way. Jesus shatters the false concepts of God we have. He calls us to a radical lifestyle. The Red Letter Christian Movement was started about six years ago. Jim Wallace was the initiator of a meeting in which Christians came together and said, we need a new name. We can't use the word evangelical anymore. The word evangelical has come to mean a lot of things that we're not. We, we need a new name. And Jim's assistant said, you were on a radio show. Uh, you were being interviewed by a secular Jewish country and Western disc jockey. And he said, you and your friend uh, Ron Sider and your friend Tony Campolo, you guys are into those red letters in the Bible. That's where the name came from. And so we said we're going to start a red letter Christian movement. It's big over in England right now. It's spreading across the United States. I want you to become a red letter Christian today. To not simply be believers in Jesus, but to allow the same Christ that was in Jesus to be in you and to motivate you to do what Jesus would do and to be what Jesus would be and to live like Jesus would live. Red letter Christians, that's what I'm calling you to be. I brought along today a bunch of wristbands like this one that says red letter Christians. I'll have them up here on the stage. Should you feel so moved when I stop, come up with a dollar and leave it. You say, why a dollar? It cost me 60 cents. So I want a dollar from you. And I promise you this, I won't keep the money. What I'll do is turn it over to Wild Goose to help pay for this conference. So that's why I'm asking you to come up, get a wristband, wear it proudly. I, I mean, I, I get all kinds of comments on airplanes. The guy says, what the hell is a red letter Christian? And I tell them, somebody who takes Jesus seriously Somebody who thinks that Jesus meant what he said. It's been good to talk to you. You're as, you're as good, let me say, you're as good an audience as you can get if the audience is predominantly white. <laughs> Nothing against white people. Some of my best friends are white people. But you should come to my church. If you can't preach, in my church you'll be able to preach because the deacons sit right up in the front row, and every time you say something good, they yell, preach, man, preach! Man, I feed on that stuff. I would have done much better here today if my deacons were here instead of you people. <laughs> and the women in my church, they put one hand in the air like this, and they go, well, just like that, well. Doesn't sound like much, but you get about 500 women giving you a well, your hormones bubble, and the men in my church, they're the best. They stand up and point at you and yell, keep going, baby, keep going, man, keep going. You don't get that from white people. White people do not yell, keep going, they yell, stop, stop. <laughs> Once a year in my church, we have a preach-off, but that's not the important thing. Once a year in our church, students come back from colleges and universities where they're studying. One by one, they come to the rostrum and tell the people what they're doing. I'm studying law at Harvard. And African-American grandmothers and grandfathers go, my, my, mm, mm, mm. Somebody else will say, I'm studying music at Juilliard. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Somebody else will say, I'm, I'm, I'm studying, I'm studying a literature at, 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 at Cornell University. 
Whoa, thank you, Lord, thank you. You think you've heard great music from the stage? You have. You haven't heard the greatest music till you hear about 500 grandmothers and grandfathers moaning and groaning the moans and groans of joy because their grandchildren are becoming what America never let them become. You know what I mean. And when, he, when they were finished and they were all sitting there, he looked at these young people and he said, children, children. He talks like that. You're going to die. You're gonna die. You don't think you're gonna die, you're gonna die. They're gonna take you out to the cemetery. They're gonna drop you in a hole. They're gonna throw dirt in your face and they're gonna go back to the church and eat potato salad. <laughs> Said when you were born, you were the only one that cried. Everybody else, everybody else was happy. That's not important. Here's what's important. When you die, will you be the only one that's happy? And everyone else will cry. And then he did what only a black preacher can do. He said, that depends. It depends on what you're living for. Right now you're collecting doctor's degrees and master's degrees and bachelor's degrees. Is that what it's about, collecting titles? Or is it about collecting, here it comes, testimonies? That's black preaching, rhythm, alliteration. Titles are testimonies. And then he did what only a black preacher can do. He swept through the Bible in five minutes. We white guys can't do that. We get bogged down. You've heard us, haven't you? Today we're going to exegete the third verse of the second chapter of Philippians. Man, Jesus God. He started in Genesis and went through Revelation. There was Moses and there was Pharaoh. Pharaoh had the title, rule of Egypt, good title. But when it was over, that's all he had. He had the title. But Moses had testimonies. Oh. He said there's Jezebel, Queen Jezebel, another good title. Queen, Queen Jezebel. But when it was over, all she had was a title, but, but the prophet, the prophet who preached against her, he had testimonies. And then there's, there's King Darius, good title king, good title king. He threw Daniel into the lion's den, but when it was over, all he had was a title. He had the title, but Daniel had the testimony. People of God, that's the truth. One of these days, they'll drop you in a hole. They'll throw dirt in your face and they'll go back to the church and eat potato salad. And here's what I want to ask you. Will you have so lived out the spirit of Christ? Will you have become so much the body of Christ in the 21st century that when they drop you in the hole, there'll be people around the grave giving testimonies, testimonies of how you blessed them and how you helped them and how you made Jesus real to them. I wish for you both titles and testimonies, but hear me people, if you gotta make a choice, go for the testimonies. God bless you. Body snatcher, heart invader, soul changer, that's what it's all about. Ruach, the name, once gets a hold of you, everything be different, there's no doubt, come together. Under me. You'll be walking, baby. You'll be talking different. You'll be seeing different. You'll be hearing different. That's the way it's going to be. Be so good looking and you will be free. Come together. Under me Cup of coffee on a downtown street Making all the difference How you see the beat Hungry and homeless Getting hugs and homes 
That's what we're doing, people. That's where we come, come together right now. Over me, Spirit of the Living God, fall fresh on me. says come together right now under me